Welcome, uh, Elite Training for Basketball uh, on Facebook. We are live. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, welcome. If you are listening wherever you listen to podcasts, welcome, because we are now uh, on uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can listen to this show. So um, whenever, wherever, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, today's a big one. Uh, with me, as always, Coach Sean Sinisi. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me again, as usual. Yeah, uh, I just love this. I think it's a blast, and I'm uh, I'm really excited. Um, this is a show, obviously, talking about basketball players. Um, everybody wants to increase their vertical jump, no matter how big it is, no matter how good it is. Uh, when I played, had a fairly good vertical jump and, and still would have loved to have some more inches on it. So you want to get into it? Yeah, that, that vertical jump almost becomes your like number stamped above your head of what your explosiveness and what your power quality looks like. It's almost like a, a field athlete saying, what's your 40? It's like, what's your vertical? Well, you know, we normally talk about our own training. So, you know, let's just bring it out there. Let's put the cards on the table. What, what's your vertical or what was your vertical back when you were at your peak? Um, I am currently at my peaks right now. So my vertical is about 27 and a half inches on a standing counter movement jump. Okay. Uh, it's probably 29 or so on like an approach jump. Yeah. And my standing squat jump is pretty close to my counter movement jump because I got no bounce. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We got, let's see if I can, I feel like I can pull it up and, and show the crowd what, who, what we're talking about. I mean, this is, uh, there's Coach Sean. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There he is. Look at that. Dude's up. Uh, I got up a little. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate that. Bit. And you're, and you're, uh, you're in your 30s, so that's, that's good. Mid 30s, man. I'll be 34 in, uh, next month. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to say I don't remember exactly what my vertical was, but um, I do remember the number 35. I think it was 35, 36 inches uh, back in the day. Definitely not now. Uh, not anywhere close to that, I'm sure. Uh, but I'll be 41 in a week, and I can still dunk a basketball. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Hell yeah. Happy with that. Cool. All right, vertical jump. <clears throat> How do we do it? How do we get it grown? How do we improve it? Um, let's just talk first, Sean, I guess, about um, what is the vertical jump? And, and, and I know that, you know, at the NFL Combine, and now there's an NBA Combine, um, they use it as a test for, for, for lower body power. They, they test your vertical jump because that's a testament to how much force you can apply to the ground, how much power your body has. And, and you know, you've worked with some, some pre-Combine guys, and, and, and how does that look in terms of training and, you know, feel free to share, like, what are some of the, you know, bigger numbers you've seen? And, uh, you know, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Interesting point. Um, I mean, it's, it's a big test. It's like I said earlier, something that they kind of use to gauge um, an individual person's athleticism as far as how much, like you said, force they can exert. Um, so for training for us, I kind of look at it twofold. Um, I want to be strong and then I also want to be explosive. So I'm looking at strength characteristics and training strength qualities as a global scale, you need to be strong to be powerful, but yeah. being strong doesn't make you powerful. So on top of strength, we also need to make sure we're training velocity, specific characteristics, rate of force development, and then also training um, tendon stiffness and things like that. So it's kind of a, a getting the ankles and hips strong. We wanna work on overall strength, but I also wanna work on counter movement, stretch shortening cycle, elasticity, and then tendon strength so that that kinetic energy is absorbed and reproduced more rapidly through the ankle. So it's, and then there's technique too, because I mean, it is a test, it's a specific test. And so if I can show someone how to do a vertical jump test more specifically, that'll translate to a better test in the combine, um, which is a little bit different than a vertical jump that you might see in a game or when you're going to the basket and you're trying to slam dunk this thing, uh, there's different movement characteristics like horizontal movement plays a large role when you're actually doing a vertical jump in a game because you're usually running forward at a full sprint. So there's different techniques involved with both different kinds of jumps. So it tends to be training the strength, training the power, training the tendons, and then also training the technique so you can pass that test more effectively. 
Yeah, the, 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 the ligaments and tendons portion of this, most people don't think about, but the connective tissue has, you know, a, a ton of memory. Um, it learns, you know, faster than muscle learns. Um, I mean, that's, it's, it's critical. It's really important, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, so what we're usually doing with that is a lot more, you know, isometrics, overcoming and yielding isometrics, where we're getting the tissue strong. Um, I mean, you, you want reactive strength and reactive strength is usually going to come from that GTO, that Golgi tendon organ. It's, it senses the stretch on the muscle and provides a feedback to the brain that when a muscle gets stretched rapidly without notice, your body's natural mechanism is to contract. That's why that, that knee, when a doctor hits your knee, they're hitting your patellar tendon. The yeah. tendon stretches, it concaves, with this bit, it stretches. And that body says, I didn't do that. Whoa, what happened? And you get a, a flexion, a, um, you know, knee flexion out of that. I'm sorry, knee extension, knee extension out of that as a protective mechanism. So the connective tissue can actually enhance your, your force characteristics by adding an additional neural impulse to, to that, um, to that jump or to that expression of force or that muscle contraction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I always tell clients too, like, um, the, the ligaments and tendons, the connective tissue actually gets stronger before the muscles. And it makes sense. Like when you start a, a, a training phase, um, if your muscles grew and stronger faster than the, the connective tissue, then you're probably going to get injured in, in that connective tissue. So the, the brain is smart. It, it knows how to prioritize what to strengthen. And, and those ligaments and tendons get strong before the muscle. And then the muscle comes on. And then like you talked about, then we have to transfer strength into power. I fully agree with that. To add on to your point, um, where the tendon needs to be stronger first, if you look at bodybuilders yeah. who typically don't train with heavier loads, you find the ones that train more on the fatigue side of things where the goal and the adaptation is more muscle bound. So they're getting more like metabolic stress, which doesn't really, the load isn't quite as heavy. So you're not getting as much strain on the um, connective tissue and the bone. You'll see more evulsion fractures from heavy, really strong bodybuilders, the muscle is so strong, it pulls the tendon off the bone and you get a break or a fracture from the, the tendon not being strong enough. So if you're not lifting heavy enough loads or loads that strain the connective tissue, you could be at a risk for having an imbalance, like you said, of muscular strength over that tendon strength. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's go into uh, you know, what exactly is the vertical jump? And, you know, I have some stuff pulled up here. Um, the, the actual breakdown, uh, and I know, Sean, you know this, the actual breakdown of the movement is called triple extension. And what you're doing is you're straightening the hips, you're straightening the knees, and you're straightening the angle, uh, angles, the ankles, or extending. So triple extension, you're extend, extending all three uh, joints at the same time. Um, and so a lot of people focus on that and you can see, let's see if we can uh, pause it here. So boom. So here's his, his hips, his knees, and you can't see his ankles, but they're, they're forward bending. So they're in flexion, it's called. And he's immediately going to change direction. Boom. And then there's the, the counter movement jump. There's the vertical jump. Uh, and he's extending at all three uh, all three uh, joints. So it makes sense to strengthen all three joints, to strengthen triple extension at the same time. What exercises do that? Um, very, very, very commonly right off the bat, right off to, to start, Yuri Verkoshansky, who, can you see this? You can't see this, can you? I see your jump screen. Yeah, we're going to, I got to redo this. Let's just go share desktop. That'll be a lot easier. Then I can move around freely. You got that? The Verkoshansky's hierarchy? Yeah. Good. So <laughs> Dr. Gary Verkoshansky, um, Sean loves this guy. I love this guy. Um, basically the inventor of plyometrics, if we can yeah. say that. He worked with a lot. He's a Russian guy. Worked with a lot of uh, Olympians back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and he said that there is nothing that can improve your vertical jump more than the barbell Olympic lifts and depth jumps. Those were the two exercises that all of his athletes used that were, they were required to use 
and they saw the most improvement in their vertical jump. Now, if there's one person that knows something about increasing the vertical jump, I would think it would be Dr. Yuri Verkoshansky. Um, so I wanna dive a little bit uh, deeper. The barbell Olympic lifts, a lot of people wanna train for these, um, don't quite know how to do it. I've mentioned him before, look at this stud. Uh, this is, uh, here we go. This is Coach Sean. This is a really good uh, clean and jerk. And if you look at, let's go back. I can't pause it because it's Instagram. If you look at his hips, knees, and ankles, he's extending at the hip, at the knee, and at the ankle all at the same time. So Verkoshansky knew well ahead of what all of us knew was that this exercise is going to get you a bigger vertical jump faster than any other vertical jump, than any other exercise can. Um, Sean, I'm starting to ramble a little bit watching you watching you lift here, but you wanna <laughs> jump in? Uh, yeah, definitely. So the Olympic lifts are categorized as a ground-based power movement, yep. uh, which goes from a rapid pull off the ground, bar scoops into your hip, and you're fully extending to your toes to lift that bar as high as you can get it. You're essentially trying to pull the bar as high as you can so that you can perform the catch uh, and essentially get under the bar and receive the bar. But yeah. the first and the most important lift portion of that lift is that first and second pole where I'm going off the grounds and then up into the hip and then I'm extending and opening vertically um, where like we talked about getting into that triple extension. So a lot of times, like you mentioned, um, the, learning the Olympic lifts takes a lot of time to be proficient enough for the lift to add the strength and power that we're looking for. Yeah. Um, so depending on the athlete, I like things like hex bar jumps, grabbing a hex bar deadlift and exploding off the ground with heavy weight. So not only are we getting the intentional speed of the movement velocity, but we're also training maximum motor unit recruitment and we're getting that protein degradation from the load. So in my opinion, lifting heavy things fast is one of the best things you can possibly do for expression of power. Um, so the Olympic lifts are one of those expressions of power you're lifting heavy loads as fast as you can it's not just grinding out a heavy deadlift it's get that thing get it up and then snap back under it so we're basically going from a relaxed to a stretch to a contraction and you're hitting all phases of that jump so i was going to touch on this later but let's just hit it now um you when you first started into the gym immediately went into cleans and were immediately good at them correct Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I took no time to get good at cleans, man. I got lucky. Um, we had a really good high school coach and he spent a lot of time developing our clean and yeah. then breaking down the progressions of it. So, I mean, if you can't do it off the floor, going from the hang position is probably the easiest, okay. a hang high pole where you're standing there, arms are long, the bar is about your mid thigh, you have a shoulder width grip and then you bend your knees hinge a little bit and then pop everything off the ground and pull that bar into your chain and getting the, stretch contract is basically that mimicking of the vertical jump i'm dropping my chest pushing my hips back same as the jump same as the clean open up my chest pop to my ankles and toes um and then drive and squat off the ground and lift this bar heavy yeah so uh, instead of my body jumping i'm jumping the bar essentially right yeah a lot of people refer to olympic lifting as jumping with weights but that's just not true um so going back to to where i was where I was trying to lead was uh, Verko Shansky always did a strength block before he incorporated these depth jumps and these cleans. Um, I, I don't know your training. You're welcome to, to, to talk about it, but I would, I would say that you were, you know, growing in strength um, a little faster than you were growing in your clean, but as your strength grew, your, your cleans also grew even more. Absolutely. And, and, one of my favorite quotes of all time, Pavel Tetsulain, another Russian, um, strength is the mother of all physical quality. So like Sean said earlier, just because you're strong doesn't mean you're powerful, but the stronger you are, you have the, the higher potential to exactly. be more powerful. And Absolutely. I always go back to the NFL guys, because these NFL guys are just half, I mean, they're genetic freaks. I watched the NCAA uh, national championship last night and that guy for Alabama, that defensive lineman that defensive tackle he's all of 310 pounds however tall he is and just accelerated through the line multiple times and like these guys 
as big as they are, are still just as fast as a lot of basketball athletes because they are training so heavy. They are training with such power and force. They are training all the Olympic lifts. Um, they can, I mean, they can move quick. I mean, and you've seen this much more up close than I have. How fun is it to watch these guys lift? It's actually, it's, it's less fun to watch them lift because <laughs> sometimes I find that a really good field athlete is a real terrible lifter. And sometimes a really good weight room lifter is not the best field athlete. So mm -hmm. I find a real discrepancy sometimes. People in the gym, they wanna get real mechanical, really blocky, whereas out on the field, you're a bit more flowy, a bit more loose. Um, so sometimes the two don't have exact transfer. So yeah. I'll see a guy in the gym and I'm like, oh man, this guy's squat. What's he doing? What, what is happening? And then I'll see him on the field and he's like a, a beautiful gazelle in, in fluid motion. I'm like, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's an interesting yeah. discrepancy. You kind of forget the skill of running and cutting and moving is so much different than the skill of squatting and, and lifting in the gym. So it's, yeah. it's easy to get caught up on chasing gym numbers but we always have to remember that we are ultimately trying to transfer our, our strength and our speed and our power back to the field. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So let's, let's break it down and let's back up a step. So we're talking about Olympic lifts. We're talking about cleans. Um, we won't even go into the, the, the snatches and the jerks and all that, but cleans and power cleans um, are kind of the, 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 the entry level and their regressions, the clean pulls and those types of things, hang sure. cleans um, that I get people into uh, the Olympic lifting and the, and the weightlifting side of things. Um, but I always, before that, make sure that they're strong enough in a deadlift, in a squat, um, in an RDL, and in these types of movements that if you, if you break down the clean, you'll see these other movements are, are a part of it. Um, and then we know that that the squat, obviously, when you clean and pull the bar up, you're you're pulling yourself under the bar and you're landing in a front squat to stand up. So you got to have a strong front squat. And we know that the front squat translates to athletic performance more than the back squat. But I also don't train the front squat before the back squat, and I also don't train the back squat before making sure people are strong unilaterally. Unilaterally. So again. You can see, like, I want to take this basketball player here. And if you're watching this basketball player, you're like, dang, I need to get some cleans in my workout. But when was the last time you back squatted? When was the last time you front squatted? How are you, how strong are you on a single leg? How can you train uh, with the front foot elevated split squat? Have you done the, uh, a split squat with a barbell on your back? Have you done a rear foot elevated split squat with a barbell on your back? Have you gotten strong to the point where, your, all the muscles involved, the VMOs, the hamstrings, the different quadricep muscles, your, your different calf muscles, uh, like Sean's talked about, your, your Achilles um, and different tendons and ligaments and all these things are strong and developed to now when you throw a load and a big force through this, this structure that you've built, it can now absorb it and it can absorb the load and it can take off and it can do what you want to do. Um, if you had a, if you had a basketball player, Sean, you have an off season. So say it's, it's June and they've okay. had, uh, they've had a good season. They've had a few weeks of, of rest and recovery. Their body feels good. They call you up, they're in the weight room or they want to come into the weight room and you have them for 12 weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to start it with a structural balance phase. And then I'm going to go in, in into, and they'll, they're getting stronger through this phase, you know, two to four weeks. And then I'm going to spend another two to four, even six weeks getting stronger through the different lifts. And this is the part that we're going to disagree on because I know you like to train weightlifting year round. Um, uh, the research that I've read says we really only need three to four weeks to literally make that strength into power. Now, I know it takes a lot longer than three to four weeks to uh, basically not even perfect, but to get competent in these lifts and and and. I mean, I, I hit you up all the time. I was, I was working on power cleans this morning and I'm texting you, Hey, check out my form. What do you think? So, um, and I've done them on and off for years and I still am not good at them. So I know it takes longer than three to four weeks to, to make it a good uh, pattern. All right. So I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that they, they've shown it only takes three to four weeks to um, transfer the strength into power. 
Um, and I didn't even mean to go my way, but I wanted to talk to you and ask you specifically, you got a basketball player that comes to you in the, in the beginning of the off season. Um, and, and you know, by the time the season starts, you want them to power clean. You want them to clean and, and, and hopefully even their body weight or more. Um, how are you starting them? And, and for the guys and girls watching, um, how, what do you want them to be good at before they start to incorporate these moves into their training program? That's a really good question. I'm going to take it two different directions. Um, I think if you're a personal trainer, strength conditioning coach in a private sector would very, very greatly differ how your approach than if you were a strength conditioning coach at a high school or a college. And since I've done both, I can tell you that I've taken different approaches for both. So if I have a basketball player that says, hey, Sean, I want to come and train with you. I got 12 weeks and I haven't trained that guy for the last two years. I'm going to take a very different approach than if I had been training that guy from a freshman to a sophomore to a junior and I've been developing his lifts, right. you know, over a long course of the time. So if I had someone that came in for 12 weeks, I would do a very similar thing. I would do like a muscle endurance or um, some sort of work capacity aerobic stage with our lifts. So we're getting back to movement. I go into like a high, small hypertrophy. We do a small uh, strength phase. Then we build into a power phase. We go down the line. Um, but I probably honestly wouldn't even have that athlete doing full Olympic variants because the time it takes to learn and produce measurable results from the traditional Olympic lifts I don't think I would have enough time to be as effective as I want. I could be spending more useful time doing other things that are going to transfer in that meantime. So I probably would have varied up our Olympic lifts and I would have done substitution lifts, like we mentioned, like a hex bar jump or a squat jump or different explosive exercises with dumbbells and other implements. Um, you don't have to necessarily do the Olympic lifts to be powerful and explosive and numerous sure. other trainers and coaches and other athletes from sports that have gotten plenty explosive without them. I like them. I have a personal bias to them with the coordination, the movement proficiency. You have to earn the right. You have to be good at other lifts before you can do them. Like you mentioned. So you have to have a great deadlift, a great front squat, a great upright row, a great RDL before you can even attempt a, a clean. Um, and the snatch is a whole other story. You have to have another, a great overhead squat and also the, you know, the deadlift RDL. So, I'm probably not taking all the time to build those individual qualities in my 12 week athlete, because I'd rather spend time knocking out other specific qualities that I know he needs from me. Um, say like other limitations, deficiencies and flexibility or uh, different, you know, sequencing and contractions. Maybe he's really bouncy, but not strong, or maybe he's really strong, but not bouncy. I'll spend more time filling in the holes versus if I had uh, like when I was working at uh, the high school, I was training, I had the kids year round, so I knew that in those phases, I could really take a long time to develop those lifts. So we had our primary block lifts were the Olympic variants. So we did tons of front squats, tons of deadlifts, tons of RDLs. Uh, and then we, and then that phase of hypertrophy using those lifts, I said, okay, you're doing clean grip, upright row, snatch grip, upright rows, clean grip, bent over row, snatch grip, bent over row. So things like that, where the positions are really similar. And then I just translated those positions closer to the Olympic lift. So then we started doing high pulls. Then we started doing, you know, hang small, hang power cleans. Yeah. First of all, getting that front squat, that front rack position ironed out. Um, and then earning the right to do your Olympic lifts after you've gotten the base. All my freshmen never did Olympic lifts as freshmen. Right. So they would do, they would get good at squatting. They would get good at deadlifting, pulling, pressing overhead. And I would give them their basic barbell movements to be good at. And then by the time they're, fresh uh, sophomore and juniors they're starting to get the intro phases of the olympic lifts they're doing their hangs their powers things like that and then probably closer to like the junior seniors i'm having them do full olympic variants we're doing full cleans i had our boys doing snatches we were doing jerks um and so it's a it, it took a lot of time for us to get to where i wanted them but um the approach is really different with a private sector athlete i would i would just find the variants that made more sense given our time frame to produce a similar result yeah, it was a long answer, but it's very no, different. No, it's approach a good there. answer. Yeah, so you, how profound you want people to be safe when they lift. That's that's a good <laughs> thing. About it. So go in and start throwing throwing weight around, thinking they know what they're doing, and then they come uh, out with like, oh, back. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's no, tough too with athletes like that. They they really they really want to be good at those next stage lifts. And I've had yeah. situations in weight rooms where we've had you know multiple NFL guys at the same time. Some guys went through college having had lots of practice with Olympic lifts. Some guys went through college doing mostly power lifts, bench squats, deadlift. So when I would see them, I had sometimes assumed 
hey, you're in the NFL, you must be good at every kind of lift. Right. And then I have had to have worked backwards with some athletes who thought they you knew like, hey, I can do this and then see the lift and it was not clean enough for me to like it. And so I had to regress. And, you know, sometimes you're dealing with egos and, you know, people who want to know that they're the best at everything. But realistically, you know, that might not be the best way to get you the result that you want. So yeah. say, hey, you're going to get more explosive doing this one than you are this one because your positions are wrong. You're out of place the coordination and the sequencing of the contractions are mismatched. So you're not going to translate this the way you would this one. Yeah. Yeah. So we know based on, I mean, this is trainer 101, the, the, the said principle specific adaptation to impose demand, our body will adapt to the demands that we impose upon it. It's very, it's pretty common. I mean, if you go out and uh, pull weeds on the first day, you know, in your backyard, you might have a sore back, you might be sore in certain places that you never were before. But if you did that day over day over day, uh, those muscles will adapt. So your body's gonna adapt to the demands that you impose on it. Um, and so we know that you have to jump. <laughs> you have to <laughs> practice jumping at least a little bit. So you know your, your story of, of freshmen and even sophomores not doing Olympic lifts, but rather getting stronger, um, I still see it, and, and you as a, a basketball player is watching, should see it as a, as a phenomenal approach because chances are you're probably still playing basketball. So you're probably still jumping. So that you're using the muscles um, that, uh, are, that you are jumping with in the weight room when you're squatting. One key, and if you don't take anything else out of this, take this away, is it's critical that when you do your front squat, when you do your deadlift, wh whatever lift it is that you're doing, um, um, when you go to make the move back up in the squat or in the deadlift, it's gotta be as fast as possible, okay? The triple extension, the vertical jump, it's, it's, it's a test of power. It's type two muscle fibers. It's boom, it's, it's fast, it's getting explosive. So regardless of if you're moving fast under the bar, and I'll show you an example here in a second, um, there's only two ways to, to, to recruit those type two fibers, and that's move something fast or move something heavy. Because uh, yes. when you move something heavy, those, those type two fibers are the ones doing the, the majority of the lifting. Um, but the science has shown that it's the brain's intent to move fast and not necessarily the velocity at which you move. So make sure when you squat, when you deadlift, you are applying as much of a force into the ground as possible. Because like we've talked about this whole time, that vertical jump is, is basically a breakdown of your power. It's a breakdown of your rate of force development. So how much force can you apply in a fast rate? How much force can you apply quickly? If you can apply a greater force, AKA if you're stronger, if you can apply a greater force, the chances are you can, you can apply a greater force potentially faster when you start training that way. So make sure we're practicing jumping, but man, get strong, get as strong as you can. Um, I'm a big fan of relative strength. So we talk about different strength principles and uh, I always go back to the, the NFL football, American football. If you, when you think of maximal strength, you think of the offensive lineman, the defensive lineman, just moving as much weight as possible, does, regardless of anything else. But if you look at like these, like last night, there were the wide receiver for Alabama, Devontae Smith, and the running back, Najee Harris, like these guys are, these guys, I don't know what they do in the weight room, but they need to do what wide receivers and running backs do. They need to be able to cut and they need to be able to run fast and all these things. So, so get strong relative to what it is that you need to do. If you're a big man, maybe you can get stronger than if you're a point guard trying to be, you know, John Morant and Zippy all around the basketball court. But, um, and I just used the word Zippy, but, um, but get strong relative to your body weight. And so we know relative strength, functional hypertrophy, we're talking in that six to eight rep range. And when I say six to eight rep range, I mean, six to eight is all you should be able to do. So if you're doing a back squat and you get to eight and you rack the bar, and you say, oh, I probably could have got to 10 or 12. That's not relative strength. You're working at a lesser intensity. We need to up the intensity. So when you, you're basically failing on the last rep, okay? That's pretty much where we want you to be. Maybe you have one in the tank if, if you got a long way ahead of you, you know, in the, in the workout. But we're working pretty much to failure in that six to eight rep range. And that's a good relative strength, um, 
uh, relative strength protocol. I want to show this too. We, we talk about um, specific adaptation. Uh, this is me this morning. Uh, I'm just doing quarter squats. And, and one thing I like about the inertia squats is with the vertical jump, you go down and then you come back up. It's a, it's a stretch shortening cycle. We know that the muscles work better when they're stretched immediately before uh, they're used. Sean mentioned the Golgi tendon organ earlier. Um, so if you don't have the ability to stretch before you use it, it makes it tougher, but it also makes you stronger quicker. So these quarter squats that I'm doing, I'm bringing the bar down to the rails and then I'm pausing for two seconds, two, one, and then I'm going back up. So that, in, so I have to overcome inertia. I'm overcoming a dead weight. Um, and then this is also about the distance and the angles that you're going to squat in a vertical jump. So I'm training that angle, not that I'm trying to increase my vertical, but, um, but this is a, a potentially good exercise for you basketball players to really train that top end. Um, but at the same time, just know that um, we got to go full range of motion. You have to train a squat through a full range of motion. Um, and we know that because do to do, do here we go um, this is a paper um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, on where it's from but but this is a, a science uh, scientific journal paper from I think 2015 uh, deep front and back squats guarantee performance enhancing transfer effects of dynamic maximal strength to dynamic speed strength capacity of hip and knee extensors compared with quarter squats so is what I did and just showed you in that video, good. Is it beneficial? Yeah, it's really, uh, if you think about it, it's overtraining those ligaments and those tendons. It's like, oh crap, he's got you know a lot of weight on this. I gotta get stronger, okay? Um, and obviously I can't squat that all the way down, um, but I do know that deep front and back squats, they guarantee performance enhancing transfer much better than quarter squats. And then uh, this is the same paper. The results suggest that full squat training is more effective for developing the lower limb muscles. So uh, between those two things, um, we got to make sure if you are doing quarter squats, if you are squatting to parallel or half squats, you, you got to go full squats. You, you know, and after that, after I did these uh, quarter squats, um, normally I would, I would do a set or more of squatting all the way down just to remind the nervous system and, and make sure the fascia knows and remembers already. Right, yeah, this is, we're, we're doing full ranges of motion here. Um, and then I, I wanted to touch on this thing. I know we, we've kind of bounced around and gone back and forth on it, but in terms of the application of force, um, and Sean does a lot of this work and, and Sean, I want you to, to hit this, you know, after, after I talk about it, be, because Sean has worked with a lot of uh, force plates and watching how much force people apply. Um, and so the scientists have found that the clean, that, that movement that we watched Sean do earlier, you apply more force to the ground than a jump squat and way more than simply jumping because you have to overcome a load more than just your body weight. So when you're trying to apply a force, which you are when you're trying to improve your vertical jump, we can't ignore the fact that the clean is the best way to do it. Sean, do you want to talk about, you know, application of force there and, and what you've seen? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I got a lot. We, that's a lot to unpack. Um, let's start with the clean and the Olympic lifts. So the Olympic lifts are touted for their forces because they produce, if you jump on a force plate, like Phil just showed, those are Newtons of force coming out of the ground. That's how much power you're putting into the ground so if you take a regular squat versus a clean you can see the differences in force the reason for that mostly is that clean comes off the ground so i'm getting a lot of pretension on the hamstrings and the glutes and then when i come back up into a power position i'm essentially whipping i'm whipping that weight up to the top so i get a really heavy counter movement negative load back to the ground before i come up so i get that big stretch from the hamstrings to the load so it creates a lot more torque in the ground to get more of that force up. So it's kind of the idea of like when someone is, is going to do a vertical jump and you see somebody bouncing and they take that pretension step and there's one big step to jump. Yeah. Um, they're using that pretension, that preload from the hamstring. Well, they're using the preload on the jump. You see them kind of bouncing. Then it's one big step and jump. The same thing happens on the clean with the hamstring. You get a pre-stretch 
which translates to a bigger movement um, and more total forces. Um, I want to go back a little bit, though, to some of the rate of force development, the yeah. quarter versus full squat, the pin squats versus counter movement, um, and unpack a little bit of what we were talking about. But so rate of force development is a huge quality to talk about. So rate of force development is peak force divided by the time it took to reach peak force. And that plays a role because we know that a sprint start, a vertical jump, or sport specific actions take milliseconds. They take less than a quarter of a second to complete. Yeah. So if I do not have a very high rate of force development, I cannot apply enough force in the given time I have to have an effective movement. So you see somebody grinding out a heavy back squat from the ground and it takes them three to four seconds. The problem with that is a vertical jump takes 0.25 seconds. So I could never have used my maximum force qualities from that max squat. So it's how, so that's why the intent of movement speed and driving out maximally, you're trying to recruit as much concentric force as possible yeah. on every single lift is so paramount yeah. because I'm trying to increase my rate of force development. I'm trying to apply force faster. It's not a lazy grind. It's a very aggressive it's a very aggressive squeeze and you're trying to be maximal with your contraction speed. Yep. Um, and so someone who has a higher rate of force development, as opposed to a higher peak force will typically have more explosive, more twitchy movements, like more explosive cuts or more explosive um, jumps. The same reason a lineman is stronger, but not as twitchy as a receiver or running back because the running back and the receiver have a higher rate of force development. They can, they can, grab more muscle fibers, activate more motor units quickly in a given time span. So the speed of contraction is very important. Um, so I would, we really want to hammer that home, rate of force. Moment. If you can do anything in the gym, anytime you finish a rep, even on your bench press, you get it to your chest, explode that thing off your chest. You're yeah. at the bottom of your squat, no matter what your depth is, explode yourself back up. You have to absolutely want that contraction to be as fast as possible. It is the overall number one thing you can do right away to enhance your speed and your power. Um, and so let's drop that ball. Let's move on to the next subject. Uh, we were talking about pin squats versus full depth squats. Um, the thing to take into consideration here is global strength and global training versus very specific strength and very specific training. So Phil has the pin squat set at a specific height but he's getting a general global adaptation on the connective tissue and the muscle for his vertical jump. So I would argue that a pin squat at that height is more connective tissue training than it is um, fiber recruitment training. Cause we talked about the speed of contraction has to match, right? So I would say those pin squats are awesome, but at the same time, you would also want to do really light, really fast, high velocity pin squats to take advantage of that rate of force development and also the rate of velocity development, which is teaching your central nervous system to contract and grab motor units faster than grinding through a slow rep. You need both, they target different things. So heavier, slower weights are good for the connective tissue, the ligaments, the tendons, but we also wanna make sure we're training the muscle so the muscle actually grows. And we also need to make sure we're training the central nervous system to produce the signal. So I need really light, fast weights. I need really medium, fast weights. And I need really heavy, fast weights. So we're training this curve, this force velocity curve. The force needs to be strong. The velocity needs to be fast. And we want to shift all these points up and over. So train the velocity, train the force, and train the muscle. So it's got to be cumulative on all those points if you want to be a well-rounded athlete. Yeah. So that's why you see Phil doing the pin squat heavy but we're also not neglecting that same squat really light and explosive. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about the counter movement. So you guys noticed he was doing it off the pin to eliminate the stretch reflex. So anytime you're doing a jump, you're getting into that counter movement that going from stretch to contracted, that's a natural mechanism your body has. Like we mentioned with the doctor hitting your tendon, it's natural for that stretch to produce a stronger contraction. So Phil's actually training one side of that. He's training the concentric portion or just the up. He's eliminated the stretch reflex so that when you add the stretch reflex back in, so here's the stretch reflex, the strong side is also stronger. So he's separated the movement 
to get more specificity on the upside. That doesn't mean we want to avoid the quick bouncing stretch reflex. I do something we call like a rhythm squat where it's a quarter squat bounce and go. It's very reactive. It's pop, 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 pop. And I want that. So that training is specifically targeting the stretch reflex. I want very quick reactivity off the bottom of my squat because what happens when you do a vertical jump is you go down up, down up. So I want that quick snap. So we want to make sure we're training all sides of these movements. It's, it's a triphasic training. I'm training the eccentric when I go in. I want to train the, the stretch shortening cycle on the way out. And I want to train that concentric on the way up. So it's, it's really hard to see one exercise and say, that's what I'm doing only. It's yep. that each exercise plays a small role in the grand scheme of things. So when you see Phil doing his um, heavy, heavy concentric pin squats, be very sure that he's also doing counter movement very rapid pace squats if he's trying to increase his vertical because he knows that that negative and bounce is going to be a crucial component for his jump also. Um, so we're, we're, we're keeping our training well-rounded, right? So we want the upside, the turnover side, and the coming inside. So we want the eccentric, the stretch shortening, and the concentric side. We can break each piece separately, train each piece separately to maximize the effect of each and then also train them cumulatively as a system so that the coordination and timing um, adds up. That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> I want to share my screen. I want to, I want to share a couple things before we go. So um, we talked about <clears throat> practically, I, I like to, I like to bring it back to practical and what does all this mean? Um, I kind of break the off season down in when you train for the vertical jump, ideally, you know, you, you're not getting weaker during this during the season, but in the off season is really when you can see gains, when you can see strides. So the off season for me, what that looks like is you want to train structural balance in the first phase. Okay, you're 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 basically you're testing and you're saying, okay, I got hamstrings are weak, or I got BMOs that are weak, or I have you know lower back QLs that are weak, whatever it may be, and you're correcting your weaknesses. It's just like if you can't dribble. You're going to practice dribbling that off season. If you can't, you know, shoot a mid range jump, you're going to practice the mid range. Um, so we're improving that. Um, second phase, we're really focusing on getting strong, depending on what you need to get strong on, um, based off the first phase. And then the third phase, we're really incorporating power. Um, and one of my favorites, uh, where to go? Um, so we talked about depth jumps. What is a depth jump? Here's a quick example. If you, if you don't know. Uh, I know there's plenty of, of uh, research online and resources, but you're basically dropping off of a box. You're loading what Sean just talked about. You're loading the eccentric to cause a greater concentric. You're loading the down to cause a greater up. So you, you basically fall off a box, boom, and then you're up on a box, okay? Fall off a box and then explode. One thing about, one thing about, um, uh, plyometric exercises. Um, like we talked about earlier, um, I think you only need them about the last month going into a season. So you're going to train and get stronger and improve your structure. You're going to make your body harder to kill. You're going to make your body more in, in, invincible. And then we're going to transfer all that into power and explosiveness. Um, plyometrics have to be done at maximal intensity, regardless of height of the element that you're using. So if you're using a box that's only six inches tall, it doesn't matter. You're still jumping as much as possible, as hard as possible, as high as possible, or you won't get the benefits. You have to jump with as maximal um, effort as possible. Um, one way that, that I like to um, improve, I could say, on the depth jump is um, hurdle jumps. And this is one of my athletes from two, two summers ago. Um, boom. Right when you land, get off the ground as fast as possible. Let's watch that again. So we're, we're landing and we're immediately getting back up and over uh, the hurdles. Uh, that's another basically way to, to, to um, load the eccentric or load the down portion of your jump. Um, and I, I love those. Um, uh, and then, you know, Sean mentioned rhythm squats. Um, I love Romanian rhythm squats and it's another great exercise that would be towards your, your peaking time before the season started. Um, but you can see she's just at a little barely quarter squat. And then with the Romanian, I don't know if you do these ones, Sean, but um, she's basically doing sets of 10, 10 
Up on yep. the toes, 10 not up on the toes. Yep. And then 10 up on the toes, and then 10 not on the toes. Um, and you, for a set of 50. 50, yeah. So that's a Romanian rhythm squat. And that's one of my favorite um, exercises to peak um, for all the reasons that Sean said. Um, and so that's really how I would take you through an off season on how to improve your vertical. Um, Sean, I think we've talked long enough, but feel free to, uh, to finish any thoughts or, or to, to wrap yeah, up with um, the bow. The, the one thing I wanted to touch on was, well, there's two things I want to touch on. Um, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if we want to take this towards improving your standing counter movement jump as if you were to do a vertical jump test yeah. or should I take us in the direction of if you're applying vertical jumps from running in yeah jumping up to the net let me go be, be let me, let me try to knock this out real quick on both sides okay. um if you guys are doing a standing counter movement jump and then you're you're trying to go for max height um do not be afraid to drop your chest and sit your hips back uh some people get they want to just only bend the knees and keep their torso too tall. The yeah. problem with that is you're not going to recruit enough with the hamstring and the glute to create that stretch reflex. So don't be afraid to drop your chest. You actually want that hip angle. You want to sit the hip back to create a greater stretch reflex on your way back up. So some of the best jumps you'll see is where the guy drops their chest, gets a big angle in the hip. And then when they open up their chest, their knees and their, their, they're locking out that last little piece through the, through yeah. the quads and the knees. Um, so chest position is pretty important on that. Um, so you don't want to just be jumping through your knees and a, a really tall chest. Um, the second that's for your test, right? That's for your vertical jump test. Second thing is arm swing. I know you really wanted to talk about arm swing and I know you didn't get to it, but, yeah. um, your arm swing, you want to, you want to hit that real quick? Yeah. yeah. Arm swing can account for up to 15% of your vertical jump. So if you, if you, if you guys go back and look at the vertical jump test and you'll see the guys that do it correctly some still do it wrong their arms are here and they drop them down and then they really violently and aggressively swing them up yep. um, shoulder strength can, can can account for up to 15 percent of your vertical jump so don't neglect uh, other parts of your body um, the abs the core is very important to transfer the power from your legs to your upper body so uh, but but yeah 15 percent of your vertical jump can potentially come from your from your shoulder so if you're if you have a 30 inch vertical, then I mean, five inches of it, you know, you can improve five inches just by strengthening your shoulders. So really easy tip for that exact reason. We know a little guy named Isaac Newton who kind of discovered some laws of gravity that say an equal force matches an opposite force, right? Equal and opposite reactions to force. Yeah. So one of the biggest things I see with athletes doing a vertical jump test is they're really lazy on their downward swing. Um, and that's not going to help you get a stretch reflex. We want to load the bottom of our movement, store that kinetic energy so that it can reverb and transfer back out. So it's a, a violent snap down, a very quick turnover at the bottom, and then a violent spring up. So snap, yeah. snap. It's a very quick movement. You definitely don't want to be lazy on the way down because that's going to hurt your way up. So if you guys are doing vertical jump testing for your team or if you're trying to get placed on a team, keep that in mind. It's violent snap, snap. Um, one more thing I really wanted to We'll just finish up here, I think would be a good play to finish. But um, vertical jumping is only good if you can actually keep it vertical. So when you guys are got a breakaway going down court, it's important to know how to make that penultimate step, get a really good blocking shin angle and transfer your forces to go up. So a lot hang of on, people hang on, hang on. So so those you just said a few words that most people probably won't know, especially if English is their foreign language. So break it down a little bit more uh, simple. Um, so when you're approaching the basket and you're running at full speed, it's going to be really important to step, turn, and then make a, a blocking step. This shin angle is almost going to put on the brakes and you really want a strong shin angle. So if I'm running, 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 I'm going to step plant and that plant leg is going to have a really strong shin angle back towards me to put on the brakes. The, the reason I need a really strong break is because the speed I have is coming horizontally. Yeah. If I get a poor break, and I jump vertically, I'm going to lose height because I'm still carrying momentum forward. So if you guys are making a, 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 a run at the basket, we need to have step, step, turn the hips a little bit, plant that leg so you have a really good block, and then we're jumping off those legs. We're trying to transfer our forces as vertically as possible yep. to minimize any of that horizontal forces carried over from our momentum. Do you want to touch on that at all, Phil? 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great explanation. And that's something that they can very well practice and improve on so that when, they, when it comes in a game, they don't have to think about it. And then um, timing of the hands, the same way on our vertical jump, timing of the hands on that block step is super important. So as I'm, as I'm striding out for that block, my hands are behind me. So it's break, hands are back. And then once the brakes are put on, I can step and jump really yeah. fluid to get my hands up. So um, if you guys, maybe Phil, we can talk a little bit about pen ultimate step and breaking down the pen ultimate step. But for you basketball players, the pen ultimate step is the, the big leaping bound break jump. So if yeah. you see guys take two big fat steps right before they hit the baskets, pop, pop, jump, that's their pen ultimate step. P N U L T A M A N T ultimate okay. pen with ultimate afterwards. Yeah. Pen ultimate. I don't, don't go back and rewind my spelling on that because <laughs> I'm not confident on it. Um, but we want to transfer forces up, not carry them through horizontally. Maybe we can break that down in another video, but um, yeah, to, to make that applicable to the court, make sure you guys are breaking, stopping, and then coming back up. Yeah. Cool. I love it. If y'all have any questions, uh, please comment, please ask. We are happy to answer. Uh, Sean, how can folks find you on the internet? Um, they can find my website, seandoesstrength.com or um, find my Instagram, seandoesstrength with underscores after each word. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you guys. Love to chat. Yeah. Go from there. Cool. Yep. And uh, please, uh, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, click like, subscribe. Uh, for those of you in the Facebook group, again, any comments, any questions, please post below. I'm sure if you have that question, someone else has the same question. So you're doing uh, a favor to someone else just by asking it. Um, don't hesitate. And we will see you next week for uh, episode 15. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Uh, take care, guys. Yep. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>